All right. So anyway, yeah, we're we're winding down on mm -hmm. Romans chapter two, and and last time we we looked at uh, we were around verse seventeen where Paul's talking. He's speaking to both Jews and Gentiles. And we're going to see that theme throughout the, the book of Romans, especially till we get up to from verse from chapter one up to chapter 11, especially. And he's, he's basically saying, you know, look, you're you're on the same ground, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you're you're not, not nobody's going to be declared righteous by the things they do or don't do. You're not going to if you have the law in stone, you're not going to be declared righteous because you have to keep it perfectly. If you just had the law written on your conscience, you're still not going to be declared righteous by keeping that. And, he's, and then when we get to chapter three, he's going to say it's only by faith in Christ that we're going to be declared righteous. So chapter two, chapter one and chapter two, he's, he's kind of setting them up for conviction that they because, you know, until you realize that you're a, a sinner, you're not going to come to faith in Jesus. It's kind of like what Jesus did with the Sermon on the Mount. You know, he had to show his disciples, look, if you think you can keep the commandments, I'm, I'm going to show you just how stringent it is. You know, how he he uh, kept raising the bar on the commandments. You think you haven't murdered? Well, I'm telling you, you know, if you're angry with a brother, it's the same as murder. So Paul's kind of saying the same thing here he's saying look you think you're keeping the law for the jews he's saying you think because you've been circumcised that, that that's going to get you into heaven because that circumcision was a big deal for for jews it's hard for us to to comprehend that because you know you think you know why does paul keep talking about circumcision why is that a big deal you know galatians and romans uh, ephesians he talks about it a lot and it's kind of i don't know to probably to the best parallel I can think of for us would be baptism. It, it was circumcision was a sign. We'll, we'll see it when we get to chapter four. It was a sign of the righteousness that comes by faith. Jim. So why was circumcision? Like, I mean, what about the women? Like they were, they were excluded from it, right? In the right. whole of the old Testament. What about them? Like when God yeah. instituted it, mm -hmm. I'm sure Great he, question. he loves the women too. Absolutely. Yeah. Great question. Um, it was anybody in the household. If you're, if you had a, if it was the, uh, the head of the household and all of his male children and everybody in the household, if they were, uh, believers, they fell under that, that same covenant. But, but yeah, I, I, I don't, I can't, you know, I can't explain exactly why, you know, why God used, well, I, I do know why he used that as the sign, but why it, you know, it appears to exclude women is, is a little confusing um, because we know that we're not saved by the faith of somebody else. So, you know, a, a wife was not saved because of her husband's faith, but it was a covenant saying that when the head of the household received circumcision, he was saying, you know, like, like Joshua, as for me and my household, you know, we will serve the Lord. We're, we're abiding by this covenant. So, and if his wife didn't, uh, didn't want to abide by that covenant, you know, he could, you know, give her a, a right of a rear of divorcement. He could say, look, you're, you're gone. So if, as long as she was living under that household, it, it was assumed that she was abiding by that same covenant. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So you're saying like the wife and the daughters um, would come under the, mm -hmm. the male of that household. Right. Right. Okay. Yep. So your mm -hmm. father or your husband, so what happens like if uh if, if the woman becomes a widow then? Um hmm. is she well, like the, you know yeah. no longer under the covenant or what? No, like, I don't think so. Work? Well well generally if if a woman became a widow, if if she hadn't if she had not born any children, the brother, brother. Of, was was required to marry her so to, to provide offspring so if she had provided if if she became you know if she bore children and and particularly a, a male you know for i don't know it's just the way it was you know it, it you know if, you, if she didn't give birth to a male it was considered shameful but if 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 she gave birth to a male the male would be circumcised as a sign that you know that she was abiding by that covenant as well so that, that's why it was it was uh, such a oh I don't know what the word I want to want to word, word I want to use. It was if you were a widow without children, particularly without a without a son, you were really looked down upon. It it was um, 
it was as though you were you were ostracized because well remember like uh, Naomi her sons died she was a widow and she was very distraught because you know she thought that God had forsaken her that's that's the way it was it was perceived you know if you're if you're a widow you don't have haven't had any sons the perception was that that God had forsaken you so that's why the you know the brother of the husband was required to marry her to provide offspring and so I don't know does that, does that make any sense yeah I'm trying to understand more so rather than understanding culture and society back in the day I'm trying to understand God's heart in yeah. like, he's the same yesterday today and forever right so right. yeah yeah I mean um, God yeah I mean God certainly loved the, the the wives and the daughters just as much as he you know loved the husbands and the fathers um, but the, yeah, they, they fell under that same covenant by the fact that they were, they, they submitted to their husband's headship, you know, just like, you know, the, like Ephesians five, the, you know, the head of Christ is God, the head of the wife is the husband, you know, if they, if the wife was willing to live under the husband's authority, she fell under that same covenant. So almost like, um, sort of not forcing but like instituting um devotion right like so that they would be devoted to the husband like wives would be yeah. devoted to the husband and that mm -hmm. interdependence sort of yeah I, I like that I like that explanation yeah yeah that's a good way to put it yeah because you know Ephesians 5 it says you know Paul says this is a mystery I'm giving you this illustration of a husband and wife said so that's the mystery is Christ and his church just like there's that interdependence between Christ and the church you know, you know the church submits to Christ and he loves her deeply he sacrificed himself for her. that's the same relationship between the husband and the wife the, the wife submits to the father to the to the husband and he sacrifices he lays down his life for the for the wife so okay. yeah it's a, so yeah, different. so the e equivalent would be baptism, like you said. But the thing is, baptism applies to both men and women just the same. Yeah. It's not it's not good, quite the same, right? Um, yeah, good point. You know, as circumcision is. Right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And although there are some that they'll they'll use Acts. Um, I think it was Acts chapter ten where they'll use that as a as a. Uh, parallel where it says you know what must when the philippian jailer said what must i do to be saved he says believe in the lord jesus christ and you shall be saved you and your household now if you look at the context of that you know, there are some that say oh see that that means if you, you know if you believe and you're and you're baptized that your whole household is saved too but if you look at the context you can see that that paul you know, was it silas paul or barnabas i forget went and and must i think it was silas paul and silas they went and and spent time with the Philippian jailer and his whole family and they all believed and were baptized. So, you know, it's not a perfect parallel, but, um, to baptism, but I don't know. But anyway, yeah, good, good point on that Cinder. But the way, the way, the reason I brought up baptism is because the circumcision was a sign. And when we get to Romans chapter four, we're going to see, uh, Paul makes it very clear. Circumcision doesn't save us. It's, it was a sign of the righteousness that comes by faith rather than by the works of our flesh. And what the, what the Jews were doing, they were putting their trust in that physical act rather than the, what the act pointed to. Yeah, pointed, go ahead, Donna. Oh, I'm sorry. I, for, I forgot I wasn't on mute. Oh, okay. I was no, just no. saying what it represented. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. What it represented. Sim similar, and the reason I bring up baptism is because we do the same thing, many of us, many denominations, I'd say, do the same thing with baptism. Baptism is a sign as well. It's a, it's a sign that we become identified with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. We identify with him in his death. Uh, he died, you know, he died for our sins. We died to sin. We died to our self-effort. He was raised from the dead. We are raised with Christ to newness of life. But some, there's some that, that put their trust in the physical act of baptism to save them. They say, oh, you know, I, I'm saved because I was baptized. Well, no, you know, you, you should have gotten baptized because you were saved. You know, the, the baptism doesn't save you. You're baptized because you've been saved. Same, they did the same thing with 
with circumcision. Baptism or circumcision was a sign of righteousness by faith. And they were saying, no, I'm trusting in my circumcision. That physical act is what's making me a child of Abraham. It's what's, what's saving me. Is that, is that making sense? What about church today that, you know, still Bible believing, but they don't baptize. They don't do baptismal in the church. I oh, really, I didn't know there were any. Yeah, but, it, yeah. because my pastor sister uh, live in Minnesota and they go to like, you know, Bible believing church, but they don't do mm -hmm. baptize there. So she sent her sons here to baptize whenever I have it at my uh, okay. house. Yeah, I, I don't know. I have to talk to him, but it's possible that they don't do it because they don't want people putting their trust in that physical act of baptism. I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't know unless I talk. But to isn't that like also an act of disobedience? I mean, Jesus told us to like, you know, go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and then, and there's also uh, some, some, dis, some disagreement on that, whether he's talking about physical water baptism or if he's talking about being baptized with the Holy Spirit, because even in, in Acts chapter one, uh, you know, Jesus repeats John's words where he says, John baptized you with water, but I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, yeah. I, I, I agree with you that that we should be baptizing people with water as a, if nothing else, as a public testimony that's saying, mm -hmm. look, I'm, I'm identifying publicly with Jesus. And I, remember Philip, Philip, you know, appeared mm -hmm. to the, 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 Ethiopian. The man, yeah. And, yeah, and after he believed, you know, he was baptized. Right. And, yeah. Not. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And also in Act, like toward the end of the book, there, you know, say to go and make disciples, baptize them in the Father, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. No, I'm not arguing against water baptism. What I'm, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, don't put your trust in that physical act of water baptism put your trust in what Jesus did and the water baptism is an outward expression of what Jesus has done for you, that he has died for your sins, that he has raised you up and made you a new creation. Is that my, my being yeah. clear? I, I, yeah, I believe, you know, I, I, I agree that, you know, we are saved by faith, not by water baptismal, but right. it's an act of obedience that we do. Sure. That. Right. Yeah. It's just the point I'm trying to make is, these the Jews were putting their trust. They were saying that this act of circumcision is what made them right with God. And Paul saying, no, that act of circumcision did not make you right with God. And same thing that, that some do today. I grew up in a denomination where that, that was their boast. You know, I, oh, I was baptized. Therefore, I'm a child of God. No, you, you get baptized because you've been uh, born again because you've become a child of God by faith and then you get baptized. So that, that's the only point I'm trying to make is that the faith, the salvation comes first and then the baptism, the, the, right. the baptism does not save you. The baptism is not what causes you to become a child of God. Is that, am, I, am I making the point clear? No, no, or, I agree. I, I'm in, okay. I, yeah. And, Chicken or the egg. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the point the point is faith in jesus saves us and then if you want to get baptized if you want to get circumcised you know go for it but so so anyway yeah so that that's what that's what paul's talking about here in at the end of romans chapter two he's saying um when verse 17 says if you bear the name of jew and you rely upon the law and boast in god if you know his will you approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law and you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. You know, if, if you're telling everybody, you know, look, these are the commandments you have to keep. This is the way to do it. You're, you correct the foolish. You teach the immature. You have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth. So he's saying he's, he's really telling you, you know, you're really getting puffed up. You think you have all the wisdom. You have all the knowledge. You have all the truth. You're telling everybody this is what you're supposed to do and not do. And then, therefore... You teach another, do you teach yourself? You know, are you practicing what you're preaching? You, you tell them, you know, don't steal, but do you steal? You know, do you take a pen from work? Do you, um, I don't know, I mean, do I goof off at work and rob my employer of time? He says, you know, if you're doing that, if you're telling everybody that you're the one who's got all the knowledge that, that you've got to keep the letter of the law to be saved, 
if you say don't commit adultery, but you commit adultery, you know, do you lust, as Jesus would say? You abhor idols, but do you rob temples? He said, if you boast in the law, through your breaking of the law, you dishonor God. So he's saying to these Jews, you know, stop boasting that of how well you're keeping the law. He says, if you're because when you, if you break it, make break one commandment, you're dishonoring God. So he's, and in verse 24, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because you, you're not keeping the law perfectly. You're, you're boasting that you're a child of God because of your circumcision, but then you go out and you break a commandment, and so, so God is blasphemed. They're going to look at you and say, well, look, yeah, you, you say that you're a child of God because of, because of how well you keep the law, and you don't keep it perfectly. And that, that's kind of the, the application for us. I mean, he's, he's definitely speaking to Jews here, but the application for us, I think, is, you know, if we're witnessing to someone or even if we're you know, just going about our life, you know, don't don't give the impression that, hey, I've got it all together. I'm keeping all those commandments. Don't look down at others. Say, look, you're you know, you're working on Sunday. You're you, know, you heathen. I'm, I'm keeping the commandments because what you're doing, first of all, you're going to set yourself up because they're going to be watching you like a hawk, just waiting for you to to stumble. And so you know, what Paul's doing, he's setting them up in chapter three that, you know, look, we've all sinned, we've all come short of the glory of God. So don't, don't boast about how well you're keeping the law, how well you're keeping the commandments because you're blaspheming God. They're going to look at you and say, yeah, that's another one of those holier than now Christians that think they're better than others. They're no better than anybody else. Is it, you've ever heard things like that? I mean, you, you see it in the media all the time. They, the media loves to uh, plaster it all over the internet all over the news when a when a christian especially a christian leader falls that's that's great news for the world here's a, a, another christian leader just shows you shows you that this christianity is all a big farce that's, that's their thought right go ahead rob you had something you wanted to share well it's like what they did back in jesus time the <clears throat> pharisees would so they used to keep phylacteries, right? Yeah. And the the thing was they would increase the size of the phylacteries, making everyone think that they knew more. Because what you do is you keep the scripture you would memorize in those. Mm -hmm. So if you walked around with a huge phylactery, you were saying to everybody, oh, look how much more I've memorized than you. Yeah, so right. So that was, you know, like an outward way of of being holier than now. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good point. Yeah. That, that was an easy way to, to demonstrate it to, to the world, right? Look how, look how holy I am. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Rob. Donna, did you have something you wanted to share? I saw you unmuted there for a minute. Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. All right. So, all right. So then, yeah, verse 25 is where it, gets into circumcision so he says for indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law because that's what they were doing they're boasting in their circumcision they were looking down on the gentiles as uncircumcised you know that was a thing you know you uncircumcised gentiles you guns and so they're looking down on says indeed circumcision is of, is of value if you keep the law if you practice the law but if you are a transgressor of the law your circumcision has become uncircumcision in other words, if you want to boast about your circumcision, you need to keep the law perfectly. Otherwise, you're you're no better than these uncircumcised Gentiles that you're looking down upon. So, all right. So then, I can, and this is about where we uh, we're gonna pick up a, a new verse there. Um, verse twenty six. He says, "If if therefore the uncircumcised man, that's the Gentile." Keeps the requirement of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? What do you think he means by that? That's that sure sounds strange. And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who through having the letter of the law and, and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? What do you think he's he means by that? Verses 20, 26 and 27. He's talking about the these. Gentiles, these uncircumcised men, if, if they keep the law, it won't his uncircumcision be counted the same as circumcision? And he says, if, if he's if he's not circumcised physically, if he keeps the law, won't he judge you, even though you have the law and you have circumcision, but you're a transgressor of the law? 
I, I think what he's saying there, and I, and I think this is all hypothetical because he's going to go on tell us in chapter three, he says nobody can keep the law. But I think what he's saying to the Jews, he's trying to bring them under conviction. He's, he's saying, okay, you're boasting in your circumcision, thinking that, you know, you, yeah, I have the law, you have it, but you don't keep it. You break it saying, okay, he says, hypothetically, if a person who's not circumcised, if he's able to keep the law perfectly, isn't he going to have the same standing with God as, as someone who is physically circumcised? And he says, and if, and if he could possibly keep the law perfectly, isn't he going to judge you, even though you have circumcision, you have the law, but you break it? He's going to judge you. He's going to say, look, you're, you know, you self-righteous person pointing fingers at me. I'm keeping the law and you're not keeping the law. Therefore, you know, you're to be condemned. I think that's the point he's making there. Is that agree, disagree? Have any other thoughts on that? Isn't it like uh, Samuel say, uh, obedient or whatever is uh, more important than? <laughs> oh, obedience is more important than sacrifice. Yeah. yeah. Well, I th yeah, I think there's some possibly a parallel there. I think what what uh, my understanding of that verse, I, I think it was it was it Saul that he was, or was it Solomon? I forget Saul or Solomon. Yeah, King Saul, uh, Saul, the first king of uh, the Israelites. Yeah, right? He's supposed yeah. to wait, but he uh, went ahead and sacrificed. Yeah, yeah right. And, and I think, I don't know, the way way I would would understand that, look, looking at it, I had to do a study on it, but I think what he was saying there, you know, obedient, he's saying obedience is better than sacrifice. Don't don't go out and think, oh, you know, I, I can just go out and sin and now I'll, I'll offer a sacrifice to cover it. He's saying, you know, look, it would be better for you to obey in the first place. And then instead of just going out and disobeying and offering a sacrifice, I, I don't know, that's, that's one. Well, my thought is like, you know, similar to like, you know, like the, the, the people that judge the, the unbelief or, you, you, you know, like it's better to like, obey the law than to like think you <laughs> you know know the law and then judge other is is like do is a doer instead of uh just knowledge yeah right yeah yeah well, it, i mean it's great if you have have the 10 commandments memorized that, that, that's wonderful but if you're yeah you don't practice it's no you good don't practice them, what big deal yeah right right yeah, I think I think that's kind of what what Paul is saying. You know, practice what you preached. Yeah, go. You're telling everybody, yeah, these are the commandments, and you know, keep these commandments. Well, if you're not keeping them yourself, you're you know, you're fooling yourself, and you're just going to come under judgment. And I mean, that's what how he started out in chapter two. Remember, he said, "I think that's <laughs> like in um, <clears throat> James James uh, one twenty two, maybe." Okay. Be a doer of the word, and mm -hmm. otherwise, if you're not, you're you're deceiving yourself. Amen. It's like you're looking at yourself in a mirror, and then you forget what it you look like. Yeah, amen. Yeah, be a doer, not just a hearer. Yeah, yeah. See, it's easy to hear it and say, "Oh, this is this is good stuff." I, you know, we I agree. We should all be keeping these commandments, and then what happens? You, you don't keep them. Yeah, yeah. Be a hearer, or do, be a doer, not just a hearer. Yeah. Thank you, Sander. Yeah. All right. So, so yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, this is kind of bringing it all full circle, circle from the beginning of the chapter where he says, he says, therefore you're without excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment, because if you're judging another, you're condemning yourself because you do the very same things that you're judging them about. So, you know, he's just continuing that to, through the end of the chapter that look, if you're, if you're self-righteous, you're judging others for breaking the law and you're breaking it yourself, you're just condemning yourself. And then he's going to continue in chapter three saying, look, you know, we've all sinned and fallen short. So that's why we need a savior. So, so anyway, um, where am I? All right. So, so how does a person become a true Jew? That's the, that's the last couple verses there. It says verse 28 and 29, he says, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Okay. So he's saying, you know, the, look, that, that physical circumcision did not make you a Jew, no more than that water baptism made you a Christian. It was, it was just a sign. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart 
by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. And I was hoping Mark would be able to join us by now. He's, he had some insights to share. He, he got called into a meeting. He said he's going to be a little late. But anyway, um, so Paul Paul's saying, look, it's not the physical circumcision. It's the spiritual circumcision that's going to make you a true Jew. And uh, that, was, that was even, that's not even a New Testament concept. That was actually, the Jews should have known that from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is after you know, the, the circumcision was given back in, in Genesis with Abraham. And do, do you remember do you remember why how that came about, why God implemented that covenant of circumcision? It was had to do with the promise that he made to Abraham. Remember, he said, through your seed, all the nations will be blessed. He made Abraham that promise when he was 75 and Abraham, he, he waited and waited, end up waiting, what, 25 years before God finally fulfilled that promise. But his promise was that, you know, through your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And, and Abe is, he's 75 years old. Sarah has been barren all her life. She's old and past childbearing years. So, you know, Abe was trying to figure out how this, Abe and Sarah were trying to figure out how this is going to come about. His first thought was, well, it's going to come through my servant, Eleazar, because that was a, that was one option. You could get a, you could, the Lord could provide an heir for you through your servant. And God said, no, it's not going to be through Eleazar. And remember, that's where that was uh, Genesis 15, where God put Abraham into a deep sleep. And he, the first covenant he had was where God alone through that smoking fire pot walked through the, the animals to show that, that God was going to fulfill this promise that Abe, it wasn't didn't have anything to do with Abe fulfilling it. And then later on, like another 10 years later, uh, Sarah, you know, God, God told him, he said, look, it's going to be through your loins. It's not going to be through your servants. It's going to be through your very loins. And then when he was what, 85, 86, Abe and Sarah, Sarah got the idea. Well, look, here's how, you know, here's how God can fulfill that promise. I'll give you my handmaiden, Hagar. And you know, that would fulfill the promise because that, you know, that's going to be through your own loins, Abraham. And we thought, well, that's, that sounds like a good idea. Ishmael was born. God said, no, that's not how it's going to be. And that's when he instituted the covenant of circumcision, which was a physical sign. He said, you're going to be circumcised in the flesh of your, of your foreskin. It was a sign that your flesh is not going to have anything to do with it. And that, that was, that's why God used circumcision. He wanted to give Abraham a vivid picture that your flesh is not going to bring about this, this promise. And we'll get, when we get to Romans chapter four, we'll get into a little more. So that's where that <clears throat> covenant of circumcision came about. He had even, even had uh, Ishmael circumcised on the eighth day and all the males, uh, everybody in his household, the servants and so forth. So everybody in that household came under that covenant. Go ahead, Sandra. Do you have something to add? Yeah. yeah and, and God tried to kill Moses um, too, mm -hmm. because of um related to circumcision right because he didn't right. um, circumcise his son yeah yep amen and his wife zipporah got out that flint knife and circumcised their son and threw the foreskin at moses i forget all the details but maybe you have some more insights to share yeah that's in uh, exodus chapter four i think okay um yeah yeah I yeah i'm not sure why um so you're you're saying that he God instituted it because he wanted to show us that um, we should not rely on our flesh for the covenant. Is that exactly. right? I'm, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't rely on your flesh. Rely on His promise. Um, Galatians four and Romans four both spell that out. He talks about in in Galatians four. He talks about. Ishmael being the son born according to the flesh and Isaac being the son born according to the promise. So, so yeah, it, that's why he had to show Abraham through that covenant of circumcision that your flesh is not going to produce this promise. And Ishmael was the son born according to the flesh 
Isaac was the son born according to the promise, according to faith. So, yeah. Um, all right. So Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, even, yeah, even in Deuteronomy, which would have been, that would be Moses' time. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, I believe it is. Yeah, okay. This is, uh, they're, they're coming into the promised land. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. You'll possess it. He will prosper you, multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, verse 6, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, in order that you may live. So, and that in order to live there would be, you know, to relate that to us today, in order that we might have eternal life. That's the only way we're going to have eternal life. That's the only way we're going to live is through circumcision of the heart. And, and even in right there, there it is in the Old Testament, that it's the circumcision of the heart, not the physical circumcision. But yet the, the, the Jews, the, the self-righteous, they kept relying on that physical act. When we get to Colossians 2, Colossians 2 kind of, it, it almost ties in circumcision in, in uh, baptism. Colossians 2, 10 through 15. If we look at Colossians chapter 2, starting at verse 10, it says, In him, that's in Christ, in Christ you have been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. In him, that's in Christ, you were also circumcised with a, circumc with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of flesh. See there again, it brings up the flesh. Okay, it's the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of, of Christ. So when we're circumcised, when we're circumcised in the heart, it's a it's a removal of the body of flesh. In other words, we're not relying we're we're not relying on our flesh to to save ourselves. So it's a removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then there he says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So there's, he's connecting the two, the circumcision of the heart. And that could very well, whether that's water baptism or baptism of the Holy Spirit, I kind of lean towards that being baptism of the Holy Spirit. You were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through the faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Could, could make an argument for either one. Uh, but anyway, um, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, together with Christ, having forgiven us all of our transgressions. He canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. That's the law, which was hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So anyway, that's the circumcision of the heart, the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. All right. Uh, Galatians 6. Let's go to Galatians 6, verse 15. 6, verse 15 says, Neither circumcision is anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And that ties in with that Colossians to as well it's not the physical circumcision doesn't matter whether you're physically circumcised or not physically circumcised what matters is you're a new creation in christ and that's what he just talked about there in colossians 2 we were raised with christ to, to walk in newness of life colossians 2 you were buried with him in baptism you were raised with him through faith in the working of god you became a new creation uh, one more philippians chapter 3 related to circumcision. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 2. Philippians 3, this, I, I love Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, verse 2, he says, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. 
the false circumcision he's talking about was, was the Jews that were circumcised in the flesh. They had physical circumcision, but he calls that false circumcision because they hadn't been circumcised of the heart. Outwardly, you know, it's like it was, well, the Pharisees, they were outwardly, they looked uh, beautiful, but inside they were, they were full of dead men's bones. They were like whitewashed tombs, looked good on the outside, but they didn't had not have the circumcision of the heart. They had the physical outward circumcision. So he calls them the false circumcision. He says, we are the true circumcision. Okay, we're the true circumcision because we worship in the spirit of God. And we glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. There again, he's talking about the, the true circumcision, puts no confidence in the flesh. That's what the circumcision, the physical circumcision was supposed to indicate, that you don't put confidence in your flesh. He says, that we're the true circumcision who put no confidence in the flesh. Well, it's, it's so ironic because they were putting confidence, they were, they were circumcised physically and they were putting confidence in their flesh, that the, the fact that their flesh had been circumcised. It, it's so, uh, I don't know, so ironic. It, it would be humorous if it wasn't so sad. So anyway, that's the, the true circumcision. We, we do not put confidence in the flesh. We, we glory in Christ. Our faith is in him, not in our flesh. And you can go the whole way down there. He said, I he says, I, I could have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has could has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I have far more reason. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish or dung in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own, not having self-righteousness. I don't have a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but I have the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And that's same, he's going to make that same point when we get to Romans chapter four. It's not the physical circumcision. It's the circumcision of the heart. It's not the righteousness that comes by the law, by our own self-efforts of our flesh. It's the righteousness that comes by faith in Christ. It's imputed. It's credited to our account. Is that, that making any sense? You some thoughts, Sandra? Yeah. So um, just thinking of Moses, couldn't he have thought that, that he had that right standing with God, a relationship with him, and therefore he didn't consider it important to circumcise his son or? That, that's a good point. Um, hmm. That's, that's an interesting thought. I, I, I can't say that I've done, I've studied that too deeply, um, but you're, you're uh, prompting a lot of thoughts. I, I'm going to have to study that a little more, but, but that, that's a good, uh, a good thought. Because we Maybe. know Moses was very close to God. Like, I mean, he had such a relationship with him where he even um, asked to see the glory of God and he, yeah. God passed by him literally, you know, and mm -hmm. such an intimate relationship with God he had. Um, so that's what I'm wondering, just like you explained. But, but that part was early in his ministry, though. It, it happened just right before he was called to go to Egypt. I mean, True. after he was called to go to Egypt. True. So he's still under training, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a point, because that, that's the that same that's that same chapter where God called him and he said, Oh, you know, Lord, I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. So you do have a good point there. Okay. So, so you're saying he, that he had not um, like really yeah, go through the, the uh, process that God like, you know, work in him, like, you know, completely yeah. just like we are, we still, you know, working in error yeah. and yeah. Uh, fix us as we go. Yeah. And well, yeah, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, Shannon, you, you make a good point, but, but even so, even if he did understand that, that, that it was only symbolic, it would still, he still should have had him, had him circumcised just like Abraham had his sons 
circumcised. Abraham knew at that point that the circumcision was just a sign, but he still went through with it. Similar with baptism today. You know, we, we know baptism is, it does not save us. It's, it's just a sign. It's an outward expression, but we still do it because it's a, it gives a public testimony. Similar with another the point of, about okay. Moses, like he was in the mountain, in the desert in median, right? I mean, like mm -hmm. he might not know all there is about to know. The first 40 years of his life was in the palace, you know, in Egypt. Yeah. And so God called him in the desert. And that's maybe he didn't not fully aware of the law of circumcisions. It could be. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, we'll have to. That, that'll be a homework Because we know um, what would I, what would he have had with him? The t well, the Torah was written only later, right? Like, yeah, I mean, right. He didn't have any. Um, mm. Did he have like the history of um, Abraham and everything? It would have been passed down by oral tradition, most likely. Um, well, no, wait. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it should have been. Yeah, because everybody, every Jew knew Father Abraham. So it would have been passed down by oral tradition. Hmm. I, yeah, that, that's a good question. I'll have to, I'll have to study that a little bit. You no, know, my point I tried to get is like, you know, he didn't live with the Hebrew. He lived with the Egyptians True. all his life. Then he went to the desert for 40 years. Oh, that's a good point. So he wouldn't have had that passed down to him for, through, from the Egyptians. Good point. Yeah, Mary. it might have missed. But then how would his wife know to do that, though? Maybe, yeah. You know, God exactly. revealed to her then. Yeah, right. Because what was she an Egyptian? No, see, the, the daughter of that Median Indian night. priest. Midnight. Okay. Okay. Hmm. And then God would know that too. I'm just saying God is a loving father and he's so right. gentle with us when we make tons of mistakes and he shows right. us grace, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm yeah. thinking like, whoa, that was harsh. Like God, you knew he didn't know much and like whatever, mm. if he was early in his journey with you, but you wanted to kill him right away for like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It just, yeah. it's the same God, right? Like right. we can't say, Oh God of the old Testament. And I've heard that, right. but like, it's the same God. Right. Um, yeah, so was... so yeah. I'm just trying to understand that. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to look into that a little bit for next week. Cause I'm, I'm curious now too. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Make, make a note that that'll be my homework assignment. Thanks, Jim. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, all right. Um, all right. So back to back to Romans two. All right. So, so yeah, you become a a, a Jew through the circumcision of the heart, and when we get to Romans nine and eleven, Paul is going to talk about the the vine the the gentiles being grafted into the vine and that's you know and they're grafted into the vine by having this circumcision of the heart they put their trust in christ circumcision of the heart they become grafted into the vine they become part of israel and that, so all of israel is both jews and gentiles all who have put their trust in christ have become circumcised of the heart so then verse 29 so he's not, he's a Jew inwardly in the circumcisions of the heart. And where does this praise come from? According to, according to verse 29, the last verse of Romans 2. God. Praise comes from God, right? Not from men. And remember, that was the criticism that Jesus had for the, for the Pharisees, that they, they wanted the praise of man, of men. They, they didn't, they weren't. They weren't interested in getting praise from God. They wanted praise from men, like those, you, like the illustration you said with the phylacteries. They wanted the men to look at them and say, "Oh, wow, look how super spiritual Rob is. He's got a you know three foot long phylactery. He must have all these verses memorized." And the uh, they, they'd sound a, a a trumpet whenever they would give an offering because they wanted the praise of men. And remember in uh, John twelve it says there there were. Uh, John 12, he says there were a lot of a number of leaders that believed on Jesus, but they were afraid to, let's see, how do you put it? They were afraid to publicly declare their faith in Jesus because they loved the praise of men better than God. It's John 12, 42, 43. 
Um, it says many, even of the rulers, believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him because they didn't want to get put out of the synagogue. That was more important to them that they didn't get thrown out of the synagogue. It says because they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And that's a good lesson for us as well, isn't it? It's the approval of God is much more valuable than the approval of man. We, we shouldn't allow fear of man to, to dictate what we do or don't do. We should be willing to, and I'm speaking to myself as much as anybody else. We should be willing to stand up for Jesus, not be afraid to proclaim the gospel, not be afraid to proclaim our, our identification with him because of, you know, fear of what, what men might do. They might kick us out of, you know, kick us out of the, the club. The, the So anyway, so that pretty much finishes up the, the chapter. What's, what's your takeaway for this, this chapter? Romans chapter two, that was the one that started out about not being, not judging others for the way they keep the law and about uh, the, about having the, the Gentiles have the law in their hearts, and, but circumcision, what's your, what's the big takeaway for this chapter? You have any thoughts, Heen? Go ahead, Rob. It's not what you do, but what you believe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's in your heart, not not the outward appearance. Okay. Yeah, good point. Yeah, it's not the outward appearance. It's what's in your heart. All right. Great. Thanks, Rob. Sandra, did you have something? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, that God is always watching the heart, the motives mm. of the heart. Mm. Sometimes even what we do may seem like we're doing the right thing, but yeah. Um, why we're doing what we're doing, I think matters most. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, the motives, you know, why do we do the things we do? We, we can do all the right things for all the wrong reasons, can't we? So yeah. Why are we doing it? Are we doing it out of a heart of gratitude for all that Jesus has done for us? We're we doing it to, to glorify God or we're we doing it to try to get the praise of men. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Go ahead. Okay. Dean remember that you know god say god hate the hardy spirit or you know mm. the plow so sometimes like you know my friend comes to me for help and i give them scripture mm. and and then i you know hope that you know then take it that i you know using scripture every time when they come for help and stuff like that yeah you, you know like but that, that's the only thing that changed me i mean like so yeah. Uh, my motive is good, but sometimes I don't know, <laughs> you know, I, I just afraid that, you know, come across as like a, a righteous or. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. And. And they get tired of it, hear it. Like, you know, like they just want an answer, but then if you reference scripture, then they're sort of like, you know, take a back step. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I you know, I mean, what, what can you do? I mean, you're doing it in love as long as you're, you know, you're not, you know, pointing, you're not, not being condemning when you're doing it. What, I, I don't know. You're not always going to get and, a. And a the positive. way it helped oh. me is like, you know, like I, I remember different friend at different point of my life, give me different scripture that I remember, like, you mm -hmm. know, the one that knowing the right thing to do and you don't do it, you have sin. You know, yeah. that's always in the back of my mind when I tend to do something that I feel yeah you know, uncomfortable about yeah. and yeah. so on. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, keep sharing the word, just do it in love and, you know, hopefully some, some will respond possibly somewhere. Yep. All right. See you, Sandra. All right. Thanks, Ian. Donette, did you have a takeaway to share? I guess just, you know, stay humble um, don't judge others. You know, God gave me grace, so mm. I, I need to extend that grace to others as well. Amen. Amen. That's yep. a good reminder for all of us. Yep. All right. Thank you, Donette. All right. Would anybody like to pray for us? I will. Thanks, Ian. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us with this hour to get into your word and to um, share our experience as we grow mm -hmm. 
in faith. Lord, we ask that you help us to stay dependent on you. There's nothing that we can do that worth anything. All the good work we've done is from you. And may we continue to be humble and love the people around us instead of um, judging them as they come for help. Um, help us, Lord, walk each day to be closer to you and to be more like you. Um, you are the Lord who accomplished good work in us. Thank you for Jim, for Donette, for Sandra, for Rob, and for Mark, who's not here today. May you continue to guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. Amen. Everybody. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Jim, I have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. I, I bought like a sewing machine, like a 